programs for the season. We have an exciting year of programs and field trips planned um, for all of you. So please keep an eye on our website and the Almanac, our newsletter, to stay up to date with these opportunities to learn and explore. Now, I'll turn the introduction of this program over to, for our speaker tonight, over to Eric Anderson. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Shelley. <laughs> um, as you may know, there are two species of cranes in Wisconsin, actually in the lower 48 states, only two of them. And if you happen to survey the wetlands of Wisconsin back in 1980, you probably would have located slightly over a hundred sandhill cranes, but zero whooping cranes. This last summer, we probably had more than 100,000 sandhill cranes in Wisconsin and 71 whooping cranes. What we're gonna to hear tonight is the chronicling of what happened with the sand hills in terms of being so successful and what is it about the whooping cranes that keeps them on the endangered species list and is making it so difficult for them to recover here in Wisconsin. And to take us on that journey tonight, we have with us the illustrious and former colleague of mine, Shelley Dubay, who's been at the university since 2006 and um, had the pleasure of teaching with her. She is a very well-regarded and well-recognized excellent teacher. She also is an extremely accomplished scientist with a number of publications under her belt, 30 plus at the last count. Besides that, she is well loved by both colleagues and students and administrators alike. And to be admired by all three of those groups takes a pretty exceptional person. And that is Shelley DeBay. So with that, I'm gonna turn over today's presentation to Shelley, and she's going to try to explain to us what's going on with the cranes in Wisconsin. Thank you, Eric. That was, wow, I should have paid you some money to introduce me like that. Um, I've never been able to say no to Eric, so I'm happy to be here uh, talking to you tonight. Um, my graduate work, my own graduate work was on small mammals, uh, flying squirrels and redback voles. And since I have been at Stevens Point, I've been studying more birds. Sometimes my, my colleagues kind of give me a hard time about that, um, switching over uh, to, to birds. Um, but it's been a really, really nice, uh, nice ride, shall we say. Um, I've had students studying cranes for the last about decade. So I'm going to talk tonight about uh, two of those graduate projects and just allude to the third that just, com uh, just com was completed uh, last year. So um, I am going to hopefully, uh, you guys, I'll, I'll start to share my screen here. Let me, uh, this is always the, the trick, right? So. It should transition into the slideshow. Here we go. Um, at any time, if you can't see anything, Susan or Eric, please let me know. Uh, or if there's some kind of interference. I mean, I've got my dog and my daughter in the house, so I'll try to run interference that way. Uh, so I, I am really excited to talk to you about, about cranes and crane um, conservation in the state. Whooping cranes and uh, greater sandhill cranes are the two native North American species. They probably did uh, at one time coexist in certain parts of their range. They both have gone through significant bottlenecks from habitat loss and over harvest. Uh, it's just too much for people to not want to have, wear those giant uh, feathers, you know, on hats and things. So, um, so both species are now back in Wisconsin. There was at one point, there were only 25 breeding pairs of greater sandhill cranes in the state. Uh, and at one point, there were only 16 wild whooping cranes uh, on the continent. So, so what we see in Wisconsin, I would say is a success story, of course, for both species. 
um, but way more so for, for greater sand hills. Uh, oh, I should mention um, Lindsay and Jess and Ross and Sabine, those are all the graduate students who have worked on this project. Um, myself and Jason Riddle have co-advised many of those students. Dr. Riddle is one of my colleagues here. Um, and then Brad Strobel is the biologist at Nasita National Wildlife Refuge. I don't know if any of you guys have met or know Brad, but he is um, quite honestly one of the most uh, forward-thinking, uh, creative scientists that I've ever worked with, um, and he's just a real gift uh, to us here in the, in the state of Wisconsin. But I also need to mention folks like Ann Lacey and Andy Gossens at the International Crane Foundation. Without their, without their previous research and continuing research on sandhills primarily, um, we wouldn't have nearly as complete a picture of what's going on um, in the world of sandhill crane management either. So there are the two species, the greater sandhill crane and the whooping crane. I'm going to talk about them and their physical characteristics and their management concerns. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the nesting behavior, cult survive, survivorship, and then um, what we've learned at Nasita has kind of given rise to the idea that maybe we need to start releasing uh, whooping cranes that are born and raised in captivity um, in another location. So Horicon, we assessed Horicon as a new release site just recently, um, and that's what Sabine Burzen's graduate project was focusing on. So. There's two crane species in North America. They're giant wading birds. And by that, I mean, you know, five, four to five feet tall. I'm sure you've all seen them. I'll play their call here in a little while. Um, but they nest in wetlands. And in certain areas in Wisconsin, like Nasita, um, both whip, whooping cranes and sandhill cranes are nesting in territories right next to one another. So they have pretty similar search images, if you will, when they're trying to come up with and create their nesting sites um, in these large contiguous wetland habitats. And so here's a good um, comparison slide. Uh, why, how people can mistake um, whooping cranes for anything else, I, I don't understand. I'm sure you guys don't understand either. Um, but I was uh, talking to Susan before the talk started and um, last year, a man in Louisiana was fined $85,000 for killing two of the non-migratory whooping cranes down in Louisiana. Uh, so we do still have some concerns with poaching um, for uh, whooping cranes, despite the fact that they're large white birds, five feet tall, um, primary that are black with a red crown. Um, red crown, of course, also on the uh, sandhill crane, but they're a little shorter, three to four feet tall, and that slate gray. Um, both species, when they are colts or baby cranes, uh, they are a brilliant red color. And I've got some pictures of, of colts here in a, in a minute. So whooping cranes are red? The red crown. They're the white. They're the white ones with the red crown. Just the the feathers on top of their head are red. Yeah, that's what I that's what I meant to say. I'm sorry if I misspoke. Just the black primaries, white body with a red crown. But the red crown is also apparent in the sandhill crane. So they when they hatch, they kind of have this russet russet red color. Both the whooping crane and the sandhill crane, when they hatch, they look very similar. Um, and for sandhills, they have that uh, rust color when they hatch, but then they yellow eyes and grayish legs, um, which are pretty diagnostic for that for that species. For the, I don't know how many of you go to Schmeekly, but last year and this year both, um, we've noticed sandhill cranes in some of the wetlands in Schmeekly. And I don't know, I'm kind of curious as to whether Eric has re remembers this, um, but I don't, and since I've been here for 15 years or so, I don't recall ever seeing sandhill cranes in Schmeekly until last year um, that have stuck around and, and seem to be there 
for a good chunk of their, um, of their spring and summer. So they're very common. And you all will recognize this, I'm sure. It's the sign of spring, right? When you start hearing the sand hills vocalizing, they will, um, it, usually at dawn, they, 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 they call in unison and the male and female have different notes that they contribute to the call. And uh, cranes in general, the 15 species of cranes that, that occur in the world, um, they have a specialized voice box that kind of allows them to each play a special role in that call. Uh, they're pretty darn remarkable in terms of their physiology as well as their morphology and the way they look. But some of their management concerns that have arisen lately, um, say in the last decade, are because of the way their bills are, are built, they are perfectly capable of going down the line of corn seeds and picking out every single seed on agricultural land. So they would be considered, you know, animal damage management concerns. And uh, in certain areas where there's a, a large population of non-breeders in the spring, they'll congregate in large numbers on these agricultural wow. fields. Yeah. So that is um, to figure out. usually rather um, just, you know, it, it can be a real problem with the, the farmers that are trying to get their corn planted in the spring. There's been a proposal to hunt them. Friends of mine who have hunted them in other flyways have called them the ribeye in the sky, to be honest, um, that they are delicious. Uh, the main concern that I have with that is that it's very hard to identify a breeding bird from a non-breeding uh, non nuisance bird, is what we would call it, or an am animal damage management concern bird that's eating corn. What will happen is in uh, late March, they will return from migration. The male and female will pair up. And when they do that, um, they'll build a nest and that they usually start breeding in April. And then one bird will be on the nest incubating the egg while the other bird is away from the nest. Uh, and then they switch incubation duties. So in the spring, when there's a single crane, you won't know if it's just a nuisance bird um, that's potentially eating too many corn seeds or if it's a bird that's just not, it's going to relieve its mate later on and there's an actual breeding pair. Um, another fa fun fact is that there's a lot more divorces, if you will, with sandhill cranes than we once thought. Um, some research that has come from International Crane Foundation down in the Briggsville area has shown that a uh, male and female that will pair for several years, the same birds because they're they might they might get divorced and then mate with other birds and then come back together in subsequent years. Um, so there's a, a there would be a lot of details that would need to be worked out in order to I think have a successful sandhill crane hunt. Um, but this is the reason why there's a proposal to potentially hunt sandhills. So here's the um, here's our our sand hills, the eastern population, but the central flyway is where the bulk of the animals are located, and there are certain states in the central flyway that do hunt them. So whooping cranes are large white birds, uh, except when they're little, and they have that red crown and black primaries that you can't see when they're when they're when their wings are folded up. Um, I'd like to point out that you can see the bird over here on the left picture. Um, there's a series of color bands on the bird and a, tel a telemetry transmitter. So the birds that are um, released in the CETA National Wildlife Refuge, they receive a telemetry transmitter to know where they migrate and also a series of color bands 
that identifies each individual um, as a number, usually a number in a, uh, uh, a, a male and a female and the year that they were hatched and whether they were wild or not. Um, and so I'll show you what some of those numbers look like um, later in the talk. But they also have yellow eyes and black grayish legs and they're around five feet tall. There's a, management concerns for them are a little on the opposite end of the spectrum. There's only one wild migratory uh, population that is um, right as of right now, they have about 550 individuals in that population. There's about 808 whooping cranes in the world um, as of uh, the last time I looked online at those, at those data. Um, the Eastern Migratory Population was initiated in the CETA National Wildlife Refuge, and this is Brad Strobel over here on the right, um, with a crane that they used to call Crazy Crane, because anytime they would go out to the nest, um, he, that particular male was extremely aggressive, and Brad's like six foot five, so he, he didn't care. This particular crane was not bothered by Brad at all. Um, so this, this Eastern migratory population was initiated as a, an insurance policy um, in order to delist the whooping crane and need to have at least two migratory populations that are um, creating young on a regular basis. And essentially what they were finding is that there's very low nest success in that reintroduced population um, of birds there in the CETA. So I was telling you guys, I might have to pick pick up my sidekick here. He's, um, he wants me to hold him. He's like my second child, honestly. So here's the, the distribution of, um, whoops, of whooping cranes. And so what we would call the real whooping cranes, the, the self-sustaining, the ones that we are um, trying to bolster their populations the most are the ones that breed in Wood Buffalo National Park, and then they, they migrate all the way down to Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. Earlier today, I was reading that between 2010 and 2018, this population doubled in size. So they are increasing. Um, it's just that they are really long-lived birds that have, they may, might lay two eggs every breeding season and one of the chicks will make it, will fledge. Um, so they just have a low reproductive rate. It's going to take them a while uh, to get to a pot. They want to have a thousand birds in that population and have it be stable for 10 years. Um, that's one of the delisting criteria. Uh, and it's just going to take a while because the birds are just really long lived um, and they don't breed uh, fastidiously like rabbits or anything like that. So there's a one self-sustaining population remains federally listed, of course. Um, and then this population was the one that um, sev several of you may have uh, kept track of Operation Migration, where they would train the birds that were released in Wisconsin to follow an ultralight to, to learn where to migrate. And they go down to Chazowitzka National Wildlife Refuge in Florida. Um, there are about 70 to 80 whooping cranes in Wisconsin now in this EMP, uh, 660 in the wild. Um, but there's two populations down here, one in Florida and one in Louisiana, that are non-migratory populations. And they have roughly 75 to 80 individuals in each of those populations. So the, um, the idea is to try to put birds in as many places to have some insurance policies out there that if uh, a hurricane or something were to come and and wipe out the, the whooping cranes as on their winter range there down there in Aransas um, that we would have several other populations that we so that we would not lose half of the world's whooping cranes. So this is what they sound like, which I would argue is every bit as obnoxious as Santos. But we'll take it, right? Because they are beautiful birds. They, um, you know, they have some really cool behaviors. All the crane species, when they are, an international crane foundation is the only place in the world that has all 15 species of cranes. And if, and if you guys haven't gone, they just opened after a massive uh, update 
and um, remodeling events. And we, I took my students there in the spring and this new Siberian crane exhibit is just spectacular. And they're the largest, the tallest um, crane species. And they're the most wetland dependent of the cranes. And so this new Siberian crane exhibit, I would strongly recommend that you guys go and, and see it. Um, so what we have is two species that nest in very similar locations and they're very similar ecologically. I would argue though that the whoopers are more aggressive in areas like Nacida where both species occur. It's definitely the whoopers that will bully the sand hills off of adjacent territories. Um, they're bigger, you know, and they actually eat a little bit more of a carnivorous diet uh, than, you know, there's been instances where a whooping crane pair will take a bittern and little pieces of it and feed it to their, their colts. Um, but a lot of frogs and stuff are, are consumed as well. And, um, and lots of, uh, aquatic insects and, and that kind of thing for both species. So the area that I'm gonna be talking about for the next two research projects is um, the um, Meadow Valley State Wildlife Area and the Nacida National Wildlife Refuge. As you guys know, the birds don't know if they're on the refuge or not. So um, they, they might be on Meadow Valley or they might be on Nacida and so we, considered both of those as our study areas. And it is a, I'm sure you've all been there, um, it is a spectacular wetland complex, 44,000 acres of contiguous wetlands. One thing that is um, important to note here is that there are water control structures that, can, that allow for impoundments to be drawn down and flooded, which was critical to the crane colt survivorship study that I'm gonna talk about um, after the behavior study. Uh, so there's an example of one of those water control structures. So, so what is the problem? Why do we have low nest success? So um, the first thing that when, when we sit in the, the whooping crane management um, meetings, sometimes we can get a little depressed, right? Because we've got all these cranes and they're not making babies and, and there's not you know, this overflow of crane colts. So we try to focus on the positive. The first is that migra migration patterns are normal. They do now migrate successfully down to Florida. The adults have very high survivorship, which they typically do at the wood buffalo Aransas population as well. They form pairs in established territories and they defend those territories from adjacent birds. Um, they do seem to select appropriate habitat, uh, including nest sites. So they, when you compare the locations where they're building nests in Nacida with those that we know about um, in Wood Buffalo, which is pretty darn remote, they look similar. Um, they breed and lay eggs and produce viable eggs and the problem comes in two places. The first is hatching colts, which is the first master's project I'm gonna talk about. And the second is fledging young, which is the, which is also, I would argue is equally as important and problematic at the Nacida location. So they just don't have babies that fledge. And there's several reasons for that that I'll share with you now. So whooping cranes abandon their nests in mass abandonment and whoopers start breeding um, at Nacida about April 1st. And it seems like tax day or sometime in the middle of April, uh, they will just get up off their nest synchronously. Um, and I remember this in the year, I think it was 2016, we were on our way to the International Crane Foundation for my class. And that was the day we got the call from Brad saying, it looks like today's the day. And all of the nests, I think there were um, 17 nests that had been initiated, 16 of those 17 nests abandoned in a 24 hour period of time. So it's a mass abandonment that was occurring. And it was likely um, from this avian specific black fly called um, the simulium is the genus of these black flies. The black flies will breed and come out 
for about two weeks in the spring. So at the time when the CETA was chosen as the release site, we did not know that that was the case. We did not know that black flies were on the landscape. Um, and so in this picture, you can see big white bird, black flies on there. All of the crown is supposed to be red, but you can see that there's a bunch of flies on this crown. Um, and that's because the blood flow to the crown is, in, is higher. And these are parasitic blood sucking black flies that come and descend on these white giant white birds that are sitting ducks or sitting cranes because they are incubating their eggs. So I wanted to show you a picture of the one crane. We've had more conversations about this pair. Um, the one crane pair that sat through black fly emergence in 2016. And you can see all of this here on, its, on the neck and on the back, that is blood from black fly parasitism, okay? So for some reason, sandhill cranes sit through this, whooping cranes get up and leave. So they've, there's these two black flies that are the problem. And so they are attracted to both eggs, like you see here, and the birds themselves. They seem to be attracted both to sandhill and whooping cranes. We don't know exactly what triggers them um, and why they go directly for the nests, um, but it is certainly the case. The other thing that we have to note about these birds is the ones at Nesita were raised in captivity. Is it that wild birds would not react the same way to black fly parasitism? We do not know. Uh, and black flies do not seem to be a problem at Wood Buffalo. It's just that the Yellow River goes um, right adjacent to the Nesita National Wildlife Re Refuge and these black flies come out of the Yellow River that they need running water to breed. And for two weeks, they are on the landscape. Um, and it unfortunately is the two weeks when the whooping cranes are breeding. So we've got a difference in in these two populations. And whooping cranes, there's you know about 80 in that Eastern migratory population, low nest success. And we've got sandhill cranes that are breeding and having an annual growth rate of 3.9%. And like Eric said at the beginning, about 100,000 of them in the state. Um, so we've got a lot of, we've got two very different species that we can compare and contrast to identify what's, what the problem is. So here's a, uh, you know, they have all this, all this jewelry, right, you know, endangered species, um, but this is a typical photograph that we would take at the nest, and I'll explain that in a little while, but you can see the telemetry device here on the right leg, and then with this bird would be red, green, red, and that then would cue the biologists and the technicians at Nesita to know which bird this is, you know, it's 20, um, 1908 or whatever its number, it, whatever its number is. So the first project was we were looking at behavior research. And so we put some cameras out at the nest and we were taking a picture every five minutes, about 300,000 photographs were generated from this effort. Uh, and we were looking for a couple of different behaviors specifically. We were looking for bill flicks and we were looking for head rubs. And those are anti-black fly behaviors that we know from the literature, according to um, other folks who have, you know, these black flies will actually affect loons and other species of nesting birds in the spring. So, um, so this, we, we wanted to see if the bill flick and head rub anti-black fly behaviors were occurring at the time when they were abandoning their nests. Um, Cause you can't watch all these nests at the same time. I would like you to know though that the birds are, these are all of the nests. Whooping cranes are in red and sandhill cranes are in, in gr uh, gray. So the nests were interspersed right next to one another, the ones that were monitored, um, just so you know that they're, that it's not that the, the black flies are only in whooping crane areas, they're throughout the refuge and all, both species were um, exposed to these black flies. So here's Jess, the grad students doing this work at the nest. This nest needed to be a, a, um, accessed by a canoe because of the amount of water. But here's what the cameras looked like. 
And we couldn't put them too close, of course, because we didn't want the birds to abandon just because we put the cameras close, um, but they were put up. The batteries would last for the entire 30 day nesting period, taking a picture every five minutes. And then at the end of the nesting period, when the birds had fledged uh, or the colts had, and the adults had left the nest um, prior to fledging, we would go and um, get all the pictures off. And so it was like Christmas. And then once the pictures were acquired, we'd have to tag those incubation behaviors. Um, and this was where we had some undergraduate minions that helped us identify what the behaviors were. So, you know, even I can identify that the bird is at the nest or away from the nest, right? There's either a bird here or, or away. And, and this is for both sandhills and whooping cranes. This could be incubating with its head up, incubating with its head tucked. We might find a bird that's alert, a bird that's preening. So this sounds like a really sexy part of, you know, ooh, it's behavior and, and you get to look at pictures, but it's very, very persnickety in how you define each of these behaviors so that if I'm going through and looking at some pictures and Brad Zinda's looking at pictures and Eric Anderson's looking at pictures, we would all know what incubating looks like or what preening looks like. So it was, there was a lot of discussion about how we were going to define these behaviors. And here's a, a pair doing their unison call um, in the morning. So um, we got some really cool pictures. Um, here's one where it would be manipulating the egg. Sometimes they would manipulate the egg right off the platform of the nest, it bloop, 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 you know, right off into the water. It's very frustrating because that's a very important genetic, you know, genetically a very important egg um, that was just lost because they're new, new parents or something. But then every now and again, you get a picture like this, right? Um, the majestic crane with the colt, and then you just hope that that colt doesn't die. <laughs> it's terrible, but, um, but that's the case. Uh, and then here's what that behavior of head rubbing would look like, that this is an anti-black fly behavior that's exhibited by these birds. And then an occasion we would end up having uh, both colts hatch, and then here's a, a sandhill with a, a colt. Um, so that was the desired outcome was, was colts on the landscape. So it was this project that was looking at success and by nest success, ornithologists, as you all know, are very per particular about definitions. And so in order for a nest to be successful, one egg needs to hatch out of that nest. It does not mean that that colt is then gonna be fledging and, and migrating with its parents. It just means that it's going to hatch out of that nest, okay? So we have four categories. Failed whooping crane nest, successful whooping crane nest, failed sandhill nest, and successful sandhill nest. And what we were looking at is all of these behaviors, incubating, um, head rub, bill flick, trying to identify what behaviors would be associated with failed whooping cranes, what behaviors are associated with su successful whooping cranes. And that's what this um, graph will show you. And so if you can notice the, the successful sandhills, successful whoopers and failed sandhills all kind of clump in one 3D space here. Whereas the failed whooping cranes are all kind of out uh, a little bit on the um, discriminating factor one axis. This axis is based upon bill flicks and head rubs. So what we basically found was that black fly, anti-black fly behaviors were associated with failure for whooping crane nests, okay? So the conclusion was black fly behavior is important um, and that now what happens is in the spring, black fly emergence can be predicted based upon the number of days that are in the West. Uh, warmer than a certain temperature. And so what essentially happens is they will go out and steal all the whooping crane eggs at Nasita if it is um, a day or so prior to when they predict that black flies will emerge on the landscape and they will force them to renest. So what is forced renesting? It's basically stealing the eggs um, because the birds will copulate and lay a second clutch 
about two weeks later. So Jessica's work was trying to identify if that works, is that increased nest success? So here's an example of how this would work. You have a control nest and you have a treatment and you have a control. The treatment nests are randomly determined and they were ones where the eggs would be taken. Controls were allowed to, to nest. And what would happen is the flies would descend upon those nests and we wanna see do these controls where the eggs were not stolen and they did not re-nest, did what happened, what was the fate of those nests? Did they re-nest or did they fail? So that's essentially what Jessica's master's focused on. This is really kind of busy, but I'm gonna share, I'm gonna go through it with you. So these are female whooping cranes over here, WI06 um, and uh, or W106 and W310 are two wild whooping cranes that actually were fledged naturally at Nasita. Everyone else is a bird that was born and raised in captivity. And the second number is the year that it was raised. And the first number is the number of, of egg, egg that it, when it hatched in that year. So Number 1203 was the 12th egg that hatched in the year 2003. That bird was released at Nasita, grew up, found out that she was a female, grew up and nested, okay? But the anytime you see a red line, that's a failed nest, okay? The line here, whoops, sorry. This line here is when black flies emerged. So black fly abundance index, you can see 11th of April, it's starting to come on and it was, you know, tax day, they all abandoned with the exception of that one nest I wanted that I shared, showed a picture of. What we don't know why these two stuck it out, but they actually um, had a colt hatch out of that nest uh, remarkably. And then all of the blue ones were forced re-nests. So what we're looking at is all of these blue ones that the eggs were stolen, what's the fate of those second nests? And what you can see is that, oh, there were a lot of birds that hatched out of those second nests. That was the whole purpose. So, so you've got first nests had a 31% hatch rate or nest success. Forced re-nests had a 66% hatch rate. And then natural re-nests, had a 66% hatch rate. So essentially what we found out was that by going and, and making the, the birds lay a second clutch, it was equal to natural re in terms of the likelihood of having a colt come out of that egg, all right? So, and how does that compare to sandhill cranes on the same area? Sandhill crane nest success is roughly um, 50 to 52%. Um, and so what we found was that it was pretty darn similar, to be honest, um, to sandhill cranes, if not a little bit higher nest success. So before I move on to colt survivorship or survival, um, Susan, can you check the chat for me and see if there's anything I should address so far? Yeah, well, nothing regarding um, that research project, but you did get a question that came in about the Sandhills in Schmeekly, and there's a, they were wondering if they're actually nesting in there. Was there any confirmation that there was a nest? Or just I did not. I saw them hanging out too, and I'm like, this is crazy. But And the, and the wetland they were in was tiny. You yeah, know, right by the west uh, waste site, waste yeah. education center. Yeah, that's where we I saw them too. So. That's where I saw them as well. Um, we never saw a colt, um, but it does not mean that they didn't have one and it didn't die. I don't, so I don't think there was any confirmation of a colt, um, but I would, you all might know more about that pair than I do, because um, I was basically, you know, stuck inside and not out with my students very frequently <laughs> in Schmeekly like I normally would have been. Yeah. Well, there is a question that came in. Did the sand hills re-nest or just stick through it? They stick through it. Okay. Oftentimes they stick through it. And, and we've talked quite a bit about why that is. 
And the, uh, Brad Strobel, probably the only one in the world that's got a freezer full of dead whooping cranes and sandhill cranes, <laughs> um, he made stuffed nests, or he stuffed some dead birds, um, made them into a fake nest, and it, the, the birds looked like their heads were tucked, you know, kind of shoved their heads down in there, but they were not truly, they weren't breathing um, because they were stuffed, and he put like fly paper at sandhill nests and at whooping crane nests, lo and behold, the black flies go to both nests, even without respiring birds at those nests. Wow. So what we, why they're attracted to those birds, I cannot tell you. Um, there's a guy named, oh God, Peter Adler, I want to say, who's like the, the black fly expert down, I want to say he's at Clemson or Georgia or something. Um, and he, they were talking to him about this problem. And and he was like, you know, we don't know really exactly what they're attracted to. There might be some kind of gland on the birds that is still present in these okay. stuffed car you know, carcasses that's that um, that they're that they're attracted to. So um, <laughs> that's the part of the project that interests me the most because I really do study wildlife health. So I've always been kind of fascinated by that aspect of this, and um, and we don't have a really good answer for it. Would the whooping cranes re-nest if they left due to black flies naturally? Or did yeah. removing the first nest increase re-nesting? That's a good question. Um, they do re-nest, but the reason we went in and got them to re-nest at the time um, was because we wanted to salvage the eggs. So we, you know, we don't want the bird, the eggs to be sitting there in the hot or in the cold, depending upon what kind of a spring we're having, um, unincubated. And we've got pictures of wolves and coyotes and eagles coming onto the nest platform and, and consuming either colts or eggs. So because of the, how valuable the eggs were and are, that's why um, we would go and salvage them. And it, are those taken to ICF, uh, International Crane Foundation? Um, there was a question about that. Okay. It depends. Um, they are taken to a place that has enough incubators to accommodate them. Um, okay. A lot of times they are split up. So um, before Patuxent was no longer a crane location, um, they would, some of them would get on the, the, the airplane in a little cooler and they would go to Patuxent um, on the East Coast. Some of them would go to ICF. Some of them would actually, there's a few incubators at Nasita where they would just keep them until they would find a home for them, hmm. um, until they would find a place. So now there's in some incubation going on, I think at White Oak in, in Florida, um, the Smithsonian, um, uh, the National Zoo now um, has some. So wow. they're, they're all over now. Um, but they might, the first stop might be ICF. Okay. Great. They don't have enough incubators for everybody. You know, yeah. you might have, you might be getting 30 eggs in all at once. And that's a lot to ask. The incubation room at ICF is very small. Okay, great. That's the Good questions question. for now. Yeah. Thanks everyone. So, um, so this is Ross and, and this is Sabine holding this colt. This is my daughter many years ago. She's now um, an inch and a half taller than I am, which I'm not terribly excited about, but, um, but this is uh, Ross affixing a transmitter to the back of a colt. So this became like round two, uh, this was colt survivorship. So we have a little bit better idea now how to make more cranes come out of nests um, so what can we do about the colt survival part? Um, so what, what they would do is they would, they would run down the colts in the wetlands um, and put them into pillowcases. They don't do a good job um, getting over the terrain. Normally mom and dad are kind of put putting around and helping them and waiting for them. So they, they don't do very well. Um, so luckily we don't need to drug them. We don't need to cat, you know, do any kind of intense capture like they do with the adult birds. Um, instead, uh, they can just chase them and, and they can actually get them that way. Um, so the hypothesis was of course, that 
colt survivorship was going to be higher for sandhill cranes than whooping cranes. That's what we figured is that that there's something about being a whooping crane that renders them less capable of fledging than a sandhill crane. Um, and that was the goal was to just try to figure out what is normal colt survivorship. Um, and then given what we know about the wood buffalo population, it looks like sandhill or a whooping cranes preferentially move their colts into a wetland complex that is not very full because the crane, the colts can't really travel very well and certainly not drought conditions because then all the predators can get to them much more easily. Um, and also the prey items um, like dragonfly, lar larvae and frogs and things um, are gonna be more plentiful in these shallow wetlands. So trying to look at that, and because we can actually draw down certain parts of Nisida, certain pools were drawn down, and then we were looking at whether survivorship varied based upon where those colts spent their time. So we thought colt survivor would be higher with an impoundment drawdowns, not in full pools um, that were, you know, uh, many, many meters deep. So here's, I mean, they're just cute little fuzzy things when they're little. Um, and so the way this worked um, is that the students, Sabine and, and Ross, would catch the birds and then they would glue these transmitters on with eyelash glue. So what we use to glue fake eyelashes on, and by we, I mean other people, because I don't think I could ever poke my eye like that. Um, that's what they were using to affix the transmitters. You can see what what it looks like down here. The, the patch of, uh, of fabric was dyed to be the same color as the colts. And um, it were, they would go and re-glue it every 10 days. So they'd run them down and put more glue on every 10 days and then they would locate them. Each of the transmitters had a unique um, VHF frequency that was easy, well, easy, easily might be a stretch. Ross wouldn't say easily, but it was identifiable. Um, and so if the bird is moving, if the transmitter keeps moving, then he would know the bird was alive. And they would look in on these birds twice a day, first thing in the morning, and then once again before um, sundown. And then they also were looking at uh, the wetland depth um, and, and using these water control structures to draw them down at a time when the colts would be on the landscape. So the idea was that they would be about 25 centimeters in spring and then they would be drawn to, down to about seven centimeters in August. That was the target, okay? And that would mimic the annual hydrological cycle. Um, Nasita would keep a, most of the, the pools as full as possible. They really didn't manage those pools for for cranes, they were kind of managing them more for traditional waterfowl, ducks and, and um, other aquatic vegetation that ducks eat. And so we would draw down, they would draw down certain pools um, in each of the years that Ross was, was studying the cranes. Um, so here's what happened. Um, Ross got his hands on 105 crane colts, which is an awful lot. Um, but 41 colts were mon sand hills were monitored in 2017 and only two fledged. And then 14 whoopers were, were monitored and only one fledged in 2017. 2018, very similar number of sand hills and only two of them fledged. And this was, this was like a, a banner year for whooping cranes. Um, six whooping crane colts were monitored, which is as many as were hatched. It just was not as a good a year in general, but four of them survived to fledge. Um, and I believe two of those birds are still alive today. And so here are, um, here's what, where the colts were located. So the white are whooping crane colts and the red are sandhill crane colts. All right, and those were in 2017 and 2018. So you can see that, that the, Sandhills are a little bit more widespread, but that's because there were, you know, 85 of them and there are only 20 total um, whooping crane colts. And so there's like the locations essentially of where 
the drawdowns were um, in each of those years. And then there were some natural pools that um, are associated with the pools that were drawn down, but they're not directly drawn down, but because of the way the hydrological um, connectivity works, they ended up kind of being drawn down as well. So essentially what we learned is the exact opposite of what we thought we were gonna learn, which is that whooping cranes seem to be doing better than sandhill cranes. But if you're a crane cold at Nasita, the chances that you're gonna to survive to fledging are really, really low, just in general. Um, and the survival of the colts uh, was, was highest in those drawdowns and those natural wetlands that were more at the whim of the natural hyd hydrological cycle. And they ended up looking more similar actually to drawdowns than they did to full pools. Um, and some full impoundments in 2018, 2018 were essentially drawdowns because we had such little precipitation. Um, but those full impoundments were used less frequently. But the probability of fledging was pretty darn bad, to be honest. I mean, it was 5% in 2017 if you were a whooping crane, 47% in 2018 if you were a whooping crane, 2% in 2017 if you were a sandhill, and 1% in 2018 if you were a sandhill. So I will just tell, tell you now that finding crane colts that have died is next to impossible because they would, often they would often be killed, Ross would check on them one night and they were alive. And the next morning, they were not alive. And going out and trying to find the carcass, there might just be a transmitter or there might just be a leg or something. It was very hard to identify cause of death for these colts, which is just generally true for little things in the world. Um, and then the way it kind of broke down with full or drawdown or natural impoundments, Whooping cranes and um, sandhill cranes had a little bit different success based upon where they were being raised. Um, but the drawdowns in general were better. There was some weirdness going on with, the, with full um, pools because in 2018, they essentially mimicked drawdowns. Um, but it, so sometimes you don't have complete control over what's going on out in the world, right? Um, so reproductive success of sandhills and, and whoopers was low. Um, we did not know that that was gonna be the case. We really just assumed that because there's a lot of sandhills at Nasita, we just assumed that their colts were surviving. It's very likely could be because the adults had high survivorship and, not, and, and the babies are still not making it. Um, so there might be uh, some kind of limiting factor at the refuge. Um, which then kind of gives rise to the next idea, which is maybe we need to start looking at Horicon. Um, and I don't have a, a, any slides from Sabine's work, um, although uh, she graduated a few months back. Uh, essentially, the Cliff's Notes version is that Horicon has some sand hills in it, but the rank cattail habitat might be very, very challenging for colts, regardless of species and colt survivorship. Uh, Sabine was not able to, to monitor colts in the same way, but the ones that she did monitor had very low um, fledging rates also. Um, nest success, again, pretty high. There were a fair number of nests of sandhills that were identified at Nasita. And then last year, I believe there was one whooping crane colt that was flat that that was hatched at at um Horicon. so um we're still in a little bit of a holding pattern on what to do about Horicon. um i don't feel like the overwhelming overwhelming evidence is that we should dump a bunch of whoopers into Horicon um, until we have a little more information because it seems to be pretty darn similar to Nasita, just given the work that, that Sabine did. So um, with that, what, how am I on time? I'm a little, running a little long, situation normal, right, Eric? Um, uh, but I would be happy to have um, either a discussion or any more questions, um, and I will stop sharing my screen unless somebody wants to see 
some of the, the pictures again. This is great. Um, there's a couple, um, a question that just came in. Would you anticipate less black fly problems in Horicon? That's a good question. Um, that is one of the reasons why it was selected as a site to put some birds in because there does, they, they do not have the same black fly pressure, but what they have is um, less capability to manage the habitats um, because of the way their drawdowns, um, their water control structures are, um, are, I guess, distributed on the landscape. And also because the cattail is so dense um, honestly, that's the reason why we, we didn't think that we could do a real um, colt survival study because we don't know that we would ever be able to see the colts to run them down in the wetlands because the cattail is so tall that even the adult birds would be hard to see in Horicon. So Sabine's thesis kind of transitioned into uh, being one where she flew in the air in a helicopter and identified how many sand hill nests that she could see and then and there were plenty you know I think 47 one year maybe that they found and maybe if and then and then uh, COVID hit so she couldn't fly the next year but there were plenty of sand hills there and then she put cameras out they had colts um, but then the, the handful of young that they were able to uh, monitor many of them also died um, I see a question, uh, what is the survivorship at the Canadian population? They're doing very well, Tara. Um, uh, earlier, I mentioned that, they, that the population had doubled from 2010 to 2018. Um, so they are, I think about 600, maybe 550 birds maybe in, the, uh, in that population um, and, it's, and it's increasing, it's doing much better than um, the Nasita population. I have a question with um, most birds, don't they just return to where they hatch or that could be very naive of me to think that, but if there's not any colts coming out of Nasita, why did, why, how do we continuously have a population that's nesting in, in Nasita? Good question. <sighs> they, for years, they still released birds there, Susan. Okay. So, so they were, um, many people were not willing, and I would tend to agree with this mentality, not willing to give up on it because there were so many things going right. You know, so the birds, they will go back there. That's where they, they, they go to Chazowitzka and then they fly back and they arrive and they find the birds, they, they find, they, um, find their transmitters, they know when they're nesting. And there are some birds every year um, that are uh, essentially being fledged out of there. Um, some years it might be one, other years it might be um, zero. That one year there were four um, birds, you know, that was amazing. We were all like rejoicing over four <laughs> colts, you know. Um, sounds crazy. It's, it is crazy, uh, you know, so, I don't know what the um, the management group is really going to do. Um, I I am not sure if they're looking at um, other wetland complexes in the state to maybe that yeah. are free of black flies, where we could start another another population where we don't have to go out and force them to renest because that seems to be the way to make baby cranes at Nasita. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference then between Buffalo and Nasita being so close to each other? Do we know if Buffalo had a higher survival of all of that? So uh, you're wondering if the, are you talking about the adult birds or? Like there was a question that says, what's the difference in habitat between Buffalo and Nasita? Um, and I'm kind of curious about that too. Aren't they right next to each other? You mean um, Meadow Valley? I guess I. Oh yeah, Meadow sure. Valley is. I yes, Meadow Valley. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. They. They. Um, the habitat is similar. Um, 
we don't have the water control structure you know, situation over there at Meadow Valley. Um, I don't, if, if I were to go back there, um, we didn't focus as much of our efforts, honestly, with putting cameras up at the nests over there, Susan, mm -hmm. um, just because they, you know, the, the project was being um, initiated and born from the work that Brad had been doing. And so if the birds, I mean, we, obviously we don't tell the birds where to nest, they know where to go. Um, and sometimes they did go over there to Meadow Valley and we, you know, and so Jess would go and put her cameras out over there. Um, okay. but in a, you know, the, the main focus of the work was there at Nasita on, on the refuge proper. So Elizabeth did clarify, she really is curious, what's the difference in habitat in Canada that, at the Buffalo compared oh, to Buffalo what we have National, here? Okay, I, yeah. sure. I, was, I, was yeah. thinking, I was thinking about, I was like, is there a Buffalo wildlife refuge that I don't know about? But in yeah, Wisconsin, again, me thrown too, yeah. 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 I, I get it now. Um, yeah, sorry the Elizabeth, habitat there, we're clarifying it now. <laughs> yeah, the habitat there, I've never been there. I would love to go there. Um, from pictures that I've seen of Barry Hardup, who's the veterinarian for International Crane Foundation, um, he comes and talks in our one of our classes every year, and he shows pictures of wood buffalo, and it is a majestic wetland complex, very similar. Um, I would say that it probably is not as high. There are certain areas um, up there that uh, are very more like mud flats kind of situation. Um, from what the pictures I've seen. Um, and I, the black fly pressure is not there as I understand it. Um, that's, you know, certainly, um, certainly a, a big contributing factor to the lack of nest success. Uh, so the birds too, I mean, in terms of fledging, we would need to know what the reasons are that the colts aren't surviving. Mm -hmm. and they're dying is it predators i mean there's a lot of predators out there i mean if you're uh, driving the roads at nasita there's poop piles damn near everywhere and yeah. and that's where the carner blue butterflies are always on the the coyote poop and i'm just mm -hmm. i'm just like you're an endangered butterfly you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Funny. yeah so but I guess that's butterfly habitat. We'll say that's butterfly habitat, the I hope. <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't know. Like in order for us to try to emulate Canada, I do think that we need to know why those colts are not surviving. Is it because there's not enough food and parents can't you know, get them enough food? Is it predators? Is it the fact that they, that the habitat doesn't allow them very easily to travel because I mean, these poor little birds, their legs are so short when they're colts and their parents' legs are, you know, seven, eight times bigger. So there's a lot that there's a lot of peril <laughs> to mm -hmm. be a colt, you know. Um, Brad Zinda asked about if there's discussion about Mead Wildlife Fairy, and I might add Crex Metals in there as well. Crex has been on that list. Crex, okay. I would say is, um, and I haven't been in these conversations, honestly, uh, Brad. So I, I am back when I was in the meetings for whooping crane management, Crex was being focused on more so than need. Um, and it was primarily because of its proximity to some of the places where we know birds have been nesting and they were, they have selected to go on their own. Um, so, the, that's the last I had heard. Mead would not be a bad choice. I think there's probably a lot of predators there as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think we just have to accept that some crane colts are not going to make it. Um, but if we can get them to the place where most of the nests are, are hatching colts, we can do without, a, you know, without all of them becoming, you know, to fledging age, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Has the re-nesting strategy been employed with other struggling bird species to try and increase their populations? Oh, that's a really good question. It is a very heavy-handed strategy, Tara. Um, 
I don't know that it's something that Brad loves to do. You can see the picture of Crazy Crane going after him when he was out to capture, to take his eggs from his nest. Um, it is a last resort-ish kind of thing, in my opinion. You know, um, if we didn't have black fly emergence, we would not need to go and steal, steal the eggs. I think it's, it's awfully silly of us to think that we would do better to raise them than they would do on their mm -hmm. own in the wild. There are some instances um, where Ross, the second student who was monitoring coals, um, it was during one of, it was in one of these little areas that had been drawn down. It was a pair of birds that were born and raised in captivity and they had a colt that year on their own. And he was going and trying to find the colt. Well. The parents delivered that colt to an area that was right below an eagle nest. Ross is like, oh. great, you know, wonderful. <laughs> and he and he watched the eagle come out of its nest and the two adult cranes start doing their crane business and protecting that colt from that from that eagle. Um, even though they were born and raised in captivity, they still had the instinct to know that that giant bird flying over them was a risk to their cold. So I would say this is me just, you know, hypothesizing here, Tara, I would say that if we could allow the birds to raise those young on their own, it would be the best thing for those birds as they get older and become parents themselves and have to teach their own colts where to go and forage. Um, that would potentially be a better strategy down the road for for crane conservation in Mesita. All right. Well, that was the last question in the chat. If anyone wanted to unmute themselves and ask a question that um, we'll give it a, you know, do so now. Otherwise, yes, let's give a warm um, applause to Shelly. Thank you so much. This was this is so good. So interesting. We really appreciate you kicking off our year, our speaker series this way. This has been great. Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. You can turn on your cameras and thank them. I know, I see, actually see the faces. I see too. Mary, yeah, you guys, <laughs> hi. I see, I, we, I, Eric keeps track, helps me to keep track of your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Brad, it's so good to see you. Congratulations on the engagement. <laughs> so exciting. Um, this is why yeah. I love my job. You know, I get to, um, I, I will, I make them be friends with me on Facebook really is what happens, but um, I get to keep track of all these terrific, wonderful, um, talented students <laughs> like um, Ryan Stevens and Brad Zinda and Trina uh, Weiland, who's on this call and Tara um, and then I also, you know, won't let Eric let me go in his retirement. I'm, oh, Janet, oh my gosh, you know, she was one of my first graduate students. We used to call Janet Brem the Girl Scout because she was so um, <laughs> motivated by doing the right thing, Janet. And now she's the um, area supervisor for wildlife um, biologists up in the northeastern section of the state for DNR. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you all. And Janet and Trina were con were compatriots. They were both grad students at the same time with us, um, and with Eric uh, giving us guidance as well. So my two first students, and and they're still alive, <laughs> and I we got them through it. <laughs> so yeah, this is this was been really fun. Um, thank you all so much, and thank you Eric for the introduction and. I'm going to make you go to lunch with me soon. <laughs> that sounds like a very good idea, Shelly. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Yes, thanks, Thank Shelly. I've got just a few reminders for everyone if you want to mark your calendars. Um, the first field trip of the year is coming up on Saturday, the 25th. We're going to meet at the Steinhagen um, Park. It's the Portage County's newest park and uh, do some fall birding there. We also had a um, slight change to our original plan, but we're now going to set up some dates 
for a field trip called Hawk Migration and Research with Jean Jacobs. And you'll have the opportunity to um, sit in the Hawk Migration Blind uh, near Custer Hill and uh, capture and ban uh, migrating hawks. Those dates are going to be announced. It, it's very weather dependent. The winds need to be out of the Northwest or West Northwest and um, probably a sunny day, but just keep a, uh, there'll be a sign up on our website. So once we determine those dates. Our bird seed sale is coming up October 15th and 16th. It's our biggest fundraiser of the year. Um, the um, bird seed uh, sale will be in the parking lot at, by the Pineries Bank and Metro Market. So you can find us there Friday and Saturday um, on the 15th and 16th. And then our Junior Audubon program over Zoom is going to be drawing birds on October 6th at 4 p.m. You can find the Zoom sign up on our website and we'll be drawing bald eagles. So if you or you have some uh, young ones in your life that would enjoy that, we would love to have you participate in that. So thank you again, everyone for coming this evening. It was great to see you all here. Thank great. you. Thanks everyone. Bye guys. Thank you so much. I had a great time. <laughs> see you, Sharon.